So what's new in data? Thinking data, but talking human. Best visual that we could come up with, you know. Uh, and, you know, let's face it, we all start quite young on these machines nowadays. Big data can be very, very big. So every day, this is uh, CMO of Unilever, Keith Weed. Every day, two billion people use a Unilever product. That's a lot of data coming in. Uh, and in effect, they're talking about seven billion people in the world personalizing content to them, delivering this tailored messaging. This is massive. It's really big. This is what goes on every minute of every day in terms of what's happening on Flickr and Instagram and Tumblr and all, everything. All of this stuff is going on all the time, every minute. While you're sitting in here, all this is happening. That's a lot of data. Yeah? And everybody's asking, how can I understand my customers? Why they buy, why they donate, why they change their behaviours. Sometimes, you know, sometimes you might send them a charity mailing and they'll respond and sometimes they won't. What's going on? Why does sometimes my media work, sometimes it doesn't? How do I know? Well, chances are they may actually be telling you already in all of this data. But how do you get it out? Because where does it leave the companies? You know, some companies don't really, they just kind of hide in a corner. Uh, this is too big, I'm going to go away, and hopefully big data will also go away. It's not going to go away. They don't have the right internal skills or knowledge. There's loads of platforms, loads of technology. Just looking at some of this stuff is very, very scary. Where is my data? Where's all of my data? You may have access to some pots of data, but other bits are sitting in legacy systems over there, in that corner over there, and then the web people aren't talking to the contact center people who are over there, and they're all sources of data that you need to try and bring together. And then how do I analyze that? How do you turn big data into something useful that ties into proper messaging, creative channels that are timely, relevant, and motivating. Now, I'm speaking at the IDM lecture here, so I'm going back to first principles, timely, relevant, and motivating. I sound like Drayton Bird. It's quite frightening. I'm getting old, clearly. Data is the fuel that allows you to be more timely and more relevant because it allows you to pinpoint the right people. So as Anne was saying, you're looking for lookalikes. These are the people who look like the people we're currently talking to. I am going to talk to them because they're more likely to come across. They can state their preferences. You can ask them, just like you're doing with interest. You ask them. It's amazing how many companies don't ask them what their preferences are and show that value exchange in terms of the benefit. Or you can infer them from the behaviors that they take. You look at the transactions and the value of them, and ideally all of this provides a trigger for communications, as long as you're mining it for insights, because data is useless unless you mine it for insights. And uh, I'm not the only one to say this. Uh, this is Jill McDonald uh, of McDonald's. Um, data is important, but insight is critical. You can drown in data, and you have to be able to pull out the important stuff that really matters. You have to find the insight. So most data models out there work on recency, frequency, and value. Yeah, that's what everybody talks about all the time. But there might actually be other things that are going on in terms of the person, the time, and the place that are significant in somebody's behavior happening or not happening. For example, if in, the econo if in that particular day, the news carried in The Guardian is doom and gloom, you are probably not going to sell as many pensions, pots or, IF or, or, or ISAs or whatever. Nothing to do with your campaign. It's to do with what's going on out there. I remember I, I worked on um, pensions for Department for Work and Pensions. And immediately after 9-11, even though we'd had a really successful four years of campaigns, Everything dropped through the floor. Why? Because people didn't think there was a future. So why would they prepare for the future? That's a really extreme example of doom and gloom in the newspaper. If there's a closure of a company in an area, retail sales may go down because there's fear of what's going to happen in the future. All of these things could have a localized effect. If your competitors are getting a lot of airtime and buzz out there, even while your campaign's going on, that's having a knock-on effect. 
By the way, just in case you're interested, if you advertise for the Royal Marines, the army get a lot more recruits because people think Royal Marines are army and not navy. If you advertise for the, ar the army, the RAF lose recruits. There is a massive uh, amount of play between these things. So what are we doing at Lateral Group in terms of predictive analytics to try and look at place, person and time? Trying to pull in the client's data, lots of other sources of data, I'm going to show you a slide in a minute with lots of sources on it, match that and try to give some enhanced insight to understand and tease out some of those insights. So a huge amount of external data about what's happening, but then trying to tease out why it might be happening. And that's things like individual chitter feeds. The weather has an effect on how people behave. Uh, news feeds, um, ONS data, housing sales data, TV schedules, what's on telly can have an effect on how people behave. Pulling in external data, some of which free, some of which uh, open source, some of which you have to pay for, but trying to understand and build up a picture of the consumer's behavior. So here's a case study for, um, this is very sad by the way, so I admit to actually working on right to buy the first time round with Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> uh, this is, I'm getting really old. Um, but it's about refining targeting because Right to buy, whether you uh, subscribe to that policy or not, I suspect in the Guardian they don't. <laughs> um, yeah, right to buy. It's about reinvigorating the right to buy campaign. It's a very old campaign. We did a very successful door drop, massively successful actually, 1.9 to 3.4% over the different um, test and um, phases uh, that we did. Direct mail, 5 to 5.5 to 7%. Excellent, wonderful, great. So then we looked at uh, the response evaluation. Where, who's coming through? Typical stuff we find out, 35 to 49 year olds, incomes over 25k, living in the house for 6 to 10 years. Great. Demographic stuff. Easy peasy. In particular, areas with a certain amount of social housing. And that helped us with targeting, helped us with imagery, helped us with tone. We then put the, the data through our predictive model. We found 50 additional data points were correlating with people's decision to respond to this campaign. The most important thing was the area rank. It was the quality of an area. It was a composite thing of, is it a nice area? Now, that's a subjective judgment, but it might be to do with it's got a school or it's got a park or the, the price of the housing or the crime rate, all those things together. And there are a few others uh, uh, as well. But the biggest single predictor was psychological. If I walk out my front door and I go, I like living here, I'm more likely to respond to this campaign. But it wasn't just response, because we then got sales data, um, because we've actually had a number of quarters of this now, and we've got we've shown that the sales have more than doubled from their previous things. So really good stuff for a direct campaign where you can take it all the way to the conversion. Fantastic. We we looked at response and sales, and response was interesting because it came from this wide band of nice areas. Sales narrowed down. Why did it narrow down? Because you could like to buy somewhere, but you might not be able to afford to buy it if it was too nice. And if it wasn't nice enough, it didn't matter what the government was going to give you, you weren't going to do it anyway. So that really helped our targeting to understand and rank those areas. This is uh, Domino's. They have um, one of our clients' store franchises. They do their own promotions within various catchment areas. We centralise all the data through an online, port, an online portal. That gives them the ability to look at data, do their own local campaigns. Um, what we found when we added again that weather data, TV, sports schedules had a big impact on what was going on in terms of people's purchasing of pizzas. Now, weather is important. Rain, yeah, that's obvious. But it's not light rain. It's not it's bucketing down rain. It's not snow. It's not nice. Yeah, it's rain, real rain. That's the key. And that will show an uplift on pizzas uh, that are bought. And certain TV programs going on, particularly sport related. And you can actually tailor your created around these triggers that are nothing to do with recency, frequency, and value. But, and it's a big but, data is dead. 
It's only part of the solution. It's the building block for deriving insight. But as you've obviously gathered, it's actually what's going on in here that matters. Organizations often think we are like this. We are Spock. We often talk like Spock. Um, I, did, I rewrote some copy today, which sounded like it had come from a robot. Um, I won't read it out because it would embarrass them, but it was very bad. Because the reality is 90% of the time, we're like that. Yeah, and, and not just me, cognitive psychologists say 90% of the time, we are thinking in Homer mode. I know this because I went to RNIB once and I was signing in and there was a guy delivering donuts and I stopped paying attention to signing in to going to RNIB and I started paying attention to the donuts. That's very scary. Um, we do this because we have two brains. Not literally two brains, uh, but we have two ways of dealing with the world. The first one, the system one, intuitive and emotional, very fast, don't need any cognitive capability. We, we, we get through our lives because of it. We couldn't possibly operate without this. There's too much information coming in. We have to make these automatic and holistic and associative things going on. Sometimes, however, we will stop and we will consider things, but that hurts because we have to think about stuff. We don't generally like that. It's quite hard for us. We are fundamentally, as a species, lazy, and we want to get to the next thing. So we have to understand what is motivating people, tapping into what really makes them tick. And I'm sure you would have seen loads of these words coming up. I'm going to go through a few of them, but not many. There's lots on there. Uh, behavioral psychology, behavioral economics, however you want to phrase it. Lots of books. Who's read Nudge? Excellent, well done. Who's read Influence? Go read, oh, well done, extremely well done. <laughs> right, Thinking Fast and Slow, Kahneman. Excellent, right, well go out and read these books. If you're marketing people, marketing is applied psychology. You need to be reading these books because this stuff is equally as important as transactional data. Organ donation, this is choice architecture, this first one. This is what Nudge is all about. I gave this uh, a similar lecture in Norway, and I said to them, what's your organ donation rate? And they said, 30%, very proudly. I said, ah, you have an opt-in system. He said, how do you know that? Because anybody who has an opt-in system gets these kinds of things, 20 to 30%. Anybody who has an opt-out gets 90-odd percent. Because we're fundamentally lazy. The default has changed. We're not brave enough to do that in this country at the moment. We are brave enough to do this, which is about getting people into pensions. Yeah, we are auto-enrolling. All your companies will be auto-enrolling people into pensions if you haven't got that, because this is relying on inertia selling. It's the same thing. A lot of this behavioral psychology is stuff that marketing people, particularly people in the charity industry, have known and done for years. It just has a label now and lots of experiments that actually back it up in reality. So it's all very useful stuff. This also has public pledge and social norms because I'm in. I'm part of something. This is the normal thing to do. Yeah, so there's all sorts of stuff going on in this advertising. Social norms. We're all individuals. Come on. We're all individuals. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, um, he's not the Messiah. <laughs> C. Aldini sums it up very nicely. That's the influence. So you'll know this because you've read it. If everybody's doing it, it must be a sensible thing to do. We look around and we look to significant others to validate our actions. We always feel uncomfortable if we're doing something out of the ordinary. So we want to conform. There are some of us who want to be out there and they're called eccentrics. Um, but generally, we want to follow the herd and think that we're doing the right thing. So this is O-Power, who are using social norms um, with, on behavioural design to impact on people's energy usage. So by showing them personalised information about what's happening in their area against their usage, it actually affects the person's behaviour in terms of how much energy is there. Because if they're higher than the average, they'll come down. Interestingly enough, if they're lower than the average, they'll go up, unless you put a smiley face on it. Put a smiley face on it, then they'll go, oh good, I'm better. Right? 
But if you just leave it without the smiley face, they'll actually go up to the norm, which is a little bit scary. Um, and by crunching vast streams of smart meter data, Opal can now send customers signals to alert them about their peak demand and actually try to prevent them from using too much energy. And they've saved about two terawatt hours. I don't know what two terawatt hours is, but apparently it's big. So you're doing great. Thank I was you. very impressed. Right. You are paying, Adrian, you're paying so much attention. You're like focused. You've done really well up to now. I'm, I'm very impressed. Tom, great. It's fantastic. You've got through some of the first parts of, the, of this presentation. You're paying attention still. You're doing great. Good. Big tasks. <laughs> Human beings do not like big tasks. So big financial decisions, very hard stuff. Put in a corner, run away. If you can chunk them down into little manageable tasks and you can give them rewards, Tom, you are fantastic. Tom, the other Tom, it's not bad. Keep it up. Then it actually impacts on people's self-motivation and self-efficacy about they can finish it. And you should try and reward them as they're going along. Now, you know when you see those things on the web about how far you are on the process? Because it makes you feel better. Because if, if you don't know what's going to happen to you next. When you join the army, I keep, you used to tell the army a lot. When you join, you're a civilian. You don't know what's going to happen to you. You need to be told what's going to happen to you. Because otherwise you think someone's going to cost you over the head when you walk in and, and they will never see your family again. So you're doing well, you're up to the behavioural economics example, so well done everyone. This re works in reality, this is Barclays, take one small step. This is exactly, and I just remember Barclays used to do, we're the big bank, we're huge, we're massive, and they had, I can't remember which actor it was, really important Hollywood actor, stomping around saying how big they were. That actually didn't do well, well as a campaign. So they've moved, and it was a deliberate thing, because we, uh, we did a presentation, we met uh, the people from Barclays who were behind this campaign, and it was a deliberate thing to realise that if you chunk down financial decisions, people are much happier with it. And they go, oh yeah, I'll do that little bit, then I'll do this little bit. But if you actually give them your whole financial future, it's just not going to happen. It's too big for them. Let's go back to revisiting right, right to buy. One of our successful campaigns also has a video, just went up today. Um, more and more council and housing association tenants are considering buying their homes. Perhaps you're one of them. Social norms, yeah, to make this okay to do. Eligibility, massive problem. Never had this in the past. People used to go through this massive, pro massive amount of application where only to be told, you're not eligible. We do eligible right out front now with a little chunking device that's on everything. Do you tick this box? Do you tick this box? Do you, tick? you do? Good. Carry on. And it, we get a much, much better quality of respondent. And then later on, because this process takes about 12 months, um, you actually have to chunk up the, the, the sort of decision-making process of going through to keep them interested. And we have an ECRM program to try and make these things happen. And as I say, sales have more than doubled. Authority. Okay. Who's heard of the Milgram experiment? Yeah? Okay, so the Milgram experiment is very scary. Because Milgram in involved a person sitting in a room who was supposedly wired to something that will give them an electric shock. Another person, let's say it's you, uh, is sitting in the room with me. And I'm going to ask you now to turn a dial and it will give Adrian an electric shock. Could you turn the dial, please? Thank you. Ow. A little bit more, please. Ow. A little bit more, please. You can't hear him, by the way. <laughs> a little bit, please. Trust me, I'm a doctor. Not the doctor. I'm a doctor. <laughs> now, the thing was, 65% of people will actually give a lethal electric shock to that person they can't see or hear because the doctor told them to do it. I'm in a white coat. I have authority. It's kind of how Nazism starts. It was rather frightening. But we do, it's less so with the youth now, but we actually have this thing about deferring to authority, which works exactly like this. But you can use it positively. This was one of the last campaigns I worked on at COI in government, which was using the doctor 
as a way of giving you authority to talk about a very difficult position. And actually, we managed to double the mention of key symptoms. People were more likely to go to the GP and present, and the pilot areas saw doubles of referrals, which is really important if you're preventing a life-threatening disease. And by the way, trying to get the word poo in a radio ad is really hard. <laughs> loss aversion. People are twice as likely to avoid loss so you will lose X pounds a year if you don't insulate your loft. Works better than you will gain. We hate losing things. If we own them, we hate losing them. So things like Netflix and, and Love Film, if you can get people to actually use it during the trial period, it's a case of giving up something. So they don't use it during the trial period, but you, they'll churn. OK, of 100 patients, 10 are dead after five years. 100 patients, 90 are alive after five years. Who likes the first one? Who likes the second one? Any mathematicians in the room? <laughs> Are they exactly the same? Yes. Why? Because we frame stuff. Best place to sell rollers? Boat show. If you're stinking rich, you go into the boat show. Yeah. You can't quite afford the boat. You see the roller on the way out. It's cheap by comparison. Because <laughs> you've got a frame around it. This is one I, I, I did a, a stint of freelance stuff between COI and, and uh, Lateral Group with Love Film. And I suggested to them, two cups of coffee on the high street would buy you all of these massive amounts of films. Yeah, that's framing, because it's cheap and easy. Booper just ran it. How cool is that? Health insurance that could cost you less than your da daily cup of coffee. The could bit isn't so good because that's wishy-washy language. But how cool are they? And then they've done some really good direct stuff with the, the cup of coffee. Very impressed with those guys. And here's a couple of my favourites in terms of framing from the US and Austria. <laughs> well done. Thank you very much. I like this one the best. So let's go back to Domino's. So... Dominoes, we mined their, their data, and it showed that there was, a, there was a thing about slightly more affluent people buying um, infrequently, but then there was a sudden sort of surge, and when they did buy, they bought large pizza meals midweek. So we did some social listening, uh, and that showed that school clubs happen midweek, Wednesday being the most popular. From a psychological human point of view, mum, who's a busy person, picks them up from the school clubs, too late to, to cook anything, I need help, and pizzas come to the rescue. So actually, the core thought, we're here to help you survive the, the, the week, and working with Arena, Big and Iris, that turned into Mum's Midweek Rescue Service. The insight came from data and psychology working together. Timely, relevant, and motivating. So we now have motivating in there, blending the data, research, psychological insight, builds on motivators, reduces barriers, exploits those triggers. So questions for you to ask yourselves now. Can you recognise all your customers across all your touch points? Can you handle and analyse all the data you have? And I'm including research and psychological data in that as well. Don't think of them as separate pots. Is it all in one place? Can you get insight out of that vast amount of data? Can you then create the business rules that communicate to people with those timely, relevant, motivating things, and ideally near, near real time, because you can do that in the digital space now. And then when you've done all that, because that's easy, is your marketing communications grounded in insight that has been derived from that data, the research, and understanding of human psychology? Are you thinking data, but talking human? Thank you. Any questions? You have to use the microphone. Uh, by the way, uh, I should say there is a um, white paper written by myself and Mike Cavers, our executive creative director, called Thinking Data, Talking Human. You'll be sent a link. I think there are some copies with Sarah and Laura here as well. So if you, when you go outside, uh, you can pick that up as well. Mark, going to the, 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 the questions, the last slide you showed, what's um, gap in terms of the ability to just do it exists between British businesses today and their ability to organise their data into some sort of form where 
systems such as the brain can go and uh, do the stats to give you the indications. Okay, so a lot of people are talking about big data, but not a lot of people are actioning it by, by taking hold and taking a sort of umbrella view of all of the systems across a, a business and having the power to break down the silos. Because a lot, this, this was actually quite an eye opener for me, because I, I say I used to be in the civil service for about 26 years, and I was used to silos. And I assumed that when I went out into the private sector, there wouldn't quite be so many, but there are. There are lots of silos. And that's the thing that stops people from doing that. Um, you know, so, for example, your contact center. For most businesses, your contact center is considered a cost. Yeah? Your contact center is, in fact, an investment center because your contact center is at the front end of people giving you insight about what's wrong with your product, what could be better about your product, why they have issues with how your product reaches them. And yet, people do research. Yeah? They do research about 300 people, maybe. Thousands of people calling your contact center who are a, a research tool. Yeah? Facebook, Twitter, all the listening stuff. You need to be listening to what people are saying, positive and negative. It's quite interesting. Um, sometimes people, if they have a failed experiment in the social space, they'll shut it down. Yeah? They'll say, right, oh God, this is too scary, we're going to shut it down. Some of the braver ones will try and turn it chocolatey, turn the milk chocolatey, and actually make something out of that because they've learned something from it. So it's all about a change in, I think, I think what British companies have to do is almost, well, first of all, go back to testing um, things, testing things fast, failing, and not getting quite so worked up about failure because actually that's not so bad. But if you're testing it in a sort of sensible, limited way, that failure is not going to be quite as public. But nowadays, you know, failure can go viral and get public. But you have to be aware of that. So if you're too cautious and you're too siloed, you'll never get to this view across all of the data streets. And then everybody has to respect everybody's, everybody's input. You know, the data guys have to respect the creative guys, have to respect the planners, and they all have to work together. In fact, the planners are very important. They act as a bridge between that data geekiness and the creative messaging proposition development stuff. Planning actually is going to become a really important uh, piece that's you know, vital in terms of being a bridge between those disciplines and seeing across and making everybody value everybody's input. Quite hard in, a, in, in organizations where there's always agendas. Uh, everybody has agendas. And we're, you know, we go through the same thing at that. We're breaking down those. So we're making sure those agendas are got rid of. So everybody's working collaboratively to, to achieve the end goal, which is to make the clients happy, which is making their customers happy so the client is happy. Um, I was interesting, interested that you mentioned um, smart metering and O power. Um, because you know, I think at the moment that's kind of it seems to be quite a greenfield opportunity for this yes, kind is. of thing to be done right. Um, and it strikes me they they seem to be starting to collect the data now because because that sort of data, I guess, it not only has the impact on how you deal with the customer, but also in terms of how you predict usage and requirement and what facilities are needed and peaks and troughs. Yep. and all sorts of things and, and also affecting the way consumers consume power. Yes, and D it's, a massive, it's a massive opportunity and larger organisations such as British Gas may well have the infrastructure to be able to deal with all the data that's coming in and then derive the insights out of it. Smaller ones, uh, I've just switched to Green Energy, um, who are a small company, probably I should be reading The Guardian, shouldn't I? Um, but very much so, you know, are they going to be able to deal with that? Are they going to be able to deal with the amount of information that comes through that you can then turn into behavioural insights and then turn into proactive messaging that goes out to try and affect people's energy use? Mm. It's really important and it is, yeah, it's an absolute crossroads. Uh, I contributed um, a little while ago to an Ofgem report uh, which was very much about how do we get people to 
pay attention to something that's now the second biggest household bill mm -hmm. right, after the mortgage, but is the lowest interest threshold. And actually smart metering is the gateway into getting people interested as long as it's used properly. Mm. Okay, I guess part of my question is how, how, can, how can the companies who should be doing this stuff be made to realise how important it is that they do it? Because this is the... <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Ofgem really should be... I mean, Ofgem sh should be and are, and I know they are, working with certainly the big six to make them understand mm. that this data can be used in a really positive way to help people manage, manage their bills, reduce their energy consumption, for the benefit of UK globally, you know, mm. so as a, as, but also for individuals' benefit. Mm. Um, that's a very big question. Mm. And what they, what they all need to, as I say, need to do is recognise that the data is fine, they'll get lots of data, mm. but they need to mine it and then they need to do something with it. Mm. If they don't mine it and they don't do anything with it, they might as well not have collected it in the first place. Mm. Yeah, true, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Absolutely fascinating.